Okay, I actually thought about maybe trying to explain this when, when the video was up, but I'd, I'd had a question on it, so I, I think it's probably worth trying to go through it. Remember, the video and, and Costanzo's books describes a pump that is capable of pumping a, a gradient of 200. And we kind of separated out the movement of water into here and the sodium into here. But the reality of it is that 200 gradient is basically a composite of the sodium moving from here to here and the water moving from here to here. So the net effect of the two working together will be a gradient of 200 from here to here. Okay? So in other words, the, the way it was set up, it was, well, this did 200, and when the water moved, why didn't it change it? Is that, that's, that was kind of what some people were thinking. But the point was that although we separated it, it was two things happening together to make that gradient of 200 from here to here. Okay? Got it? Good. All right, so what shall we do now? ADH. So, case 18. A one-year-old was admitted to the intensive care unit last night with fever, stiff neck and vomiting. Full sepsis workup was done, including a lumbar puncture. Spinal fluid results confirmed the patient has meningitis. His initial electrolytes were normal and he was placed on D5 quarter strength saline. And you know this is one of Dr. Todd's cases, at appropriate rate for his weight. In the morning, he gained 300 grams weight and his lab was as follows. The sodium was 124, which is really kind of low. And everything else was okay. So what's going on? What do you want to do for this guy? That's half the answer. You can have half of one of these things. <laughs> Maybe a full one. I'm, I need to be more generous, don't I? Um, so, Morgan wants to give him isotonic saline along with the, the D5. Um, and that, that really isn't it. I don't want to give this guy saline. Can, I don't want to give him fluids any kind. Uh, how much weight did he gain overnight? And how old's this guy? One years old? That's about this big, right? And he gained 300 grams. Say what? <laughs> he said he's about this big right now. Yeah, well, that's 300 grams is a lot, lot, lot of weight, right? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> about that big. <laughs> Has anybody figured it out? Um, yeah, um, ADH. But why are you saying you, you've got to go a step further and kind of help me out? What, what? Over retaining, I like that. So, and, and, and you, you just have to understand with, with your clinical judgment, this kind of disease sometimes causes an aberration in ADH secretion, okay? Um, but not always, so the doctor didn't necessarily do a bad thing. You know, the patient came in with meningitis, fluid replacement seemed reasonable. But it was, and, and I'm sure he's a pretty smart person, he knows that this sometimes happens, and so they checked the next morning and made sure that, 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 that they fixed this guy. So yeah, the, the increased secretion of ADH causes the retention of free water, 
And as you pointed out, we were already giving him essentially free water in his drip. And so that exacerbated the problem. And now his volume expanded with free water and hence the sodium of 124. So, what are you going to do for him? Don't give him fluids, please. You do like you did with the salt pill. The salt pill, <laughs> yeah. Ran that salt down in his gut, make him puke, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, a diuretic is probably not called for. In, in this case, unless there are any other neural symptoms, you probably just want a water risk. What did you say? Just leave him alone. Yeah, probably leave him alone. Just don't let him drink water, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, leave him alone. Um, if, if there is any indication of neural issues, then you might want to do something more heroic. And what, what could you do? Hmm? A hypertonic solution to draw water out of his brain. Okay. But until he shows symptoms that, that indicate that, you probably just just water restrict him. Okay. Good. You guys you guys could become doctors. That's great. Not yet. Okay. Um, there's, I think there's another case, isn't there? Yes, a 25-year-old, this is case 19 on the next page, a 25-year-old woman presents to her obstetrician in her 12th week of pregnancy. Her pre-gravid pre pre plasma sodium was 144, which is about normal, and the osmolarity was 290. Repeat plasma sodium is 132, and plasma osmolarity is 278. What's going on? She's pregnant. GFR's increased. Um, GFR's increased? Probably not. This is just one of those little things that if you become an obstetrician, you kind of know about for whatever reason, for reasons that are not totally easy to explain, pregnant women at around the tenth week of pregnancy for several weeks actually seem to have a resetting of their osmoreceptor and ADH causes the retention of water. That goes away by about the fifteenth week of pregnancy but, but it's just, it's just one of those hallmarks. So please don't treat this person. It's normal. Just a little tidbit of information. All right. So um, so let's look at ADH. Important actions. ADH. <clears throat> um, what does it say? Retain water, retain free water. Oh. No. Oh. So in, in terms of the details. Increase water permeability. Now that's specifically in the distal nephron. So everywhere past the early distal tubule, the water permeability goes up and it allows the reabsorption of water. Also increases urea permeability, but it does it selectively in the inner medulla. The other two I just added for complete, uh, completeness, and, and they're certainly in terms of test worthiness, they're not nearly as important, but also 
it turns on the loop loop sodium reabsorption and that kind of makes sense doesn't it because if we're going to make a more concentrated we need we in order to conserve water we need to make that 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 we need to work really hard to make that medullary interstitial gradient and so one of the things that we probably ought to do is make sure that the loop is pumping efficiently and so we turn on the sodium loop reabsorption and just it, this isn't in Costanzo but it also turns on ENAC and we won't worry too much about that but that's just for completion it does actually make sense but I don't think I want to really go to, into it in, in any in, in any detail so now we're going to um, look at how this all works and I'm going to draw a principal cell so let's see remember I remember this is the one that does does that but we're not going to worry about that right now <clears throat> this actually on the basolateral membrane it has a receptor for ADH and it's a V2 receptor that generates cyclic A and P and that has a number of effects okay <clears throat> this turns on aquaporins specifically aquaporin 2 here have you done aquaporins? Okay, now, um, so you have been taught that water moves freely into and out of cells, but in order to move massive amounts of water into and out of cells, we have these proteins called aquaporins, which can help us move more water across. It's still a passive process. Um, and Dr. E.K. is here. I, 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 I can't call it a facilitated diffusion of water, can I? He doesn't like that. <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, it, it, it's still a passive process, but it allows the bulk movement of more water. Oh, okay. So, mm, this is lumen, by the way. So, water. is reabsorbed so the reabsorption of free water a um, couple of other things so this is the principal cell in general um, there are cells that are principal cell like in the inner medulla but they're clearly different because they have different urea permeabilities and you won't find any textbook which will try to distinguish these types of cells but let's just call them principal cells that have some special features so And I think there's a, I think there's a three. We have urea transporters. Remember, we, we've determined that urea goes through cells, and it's a passive process. But again, if you want to move large amounts of urea, we have these facilitated transporters that allow the movement of urea. through here. This is also regulated 
by cyclic A and P. This one probably not, maybe, maybe not. But we turn on the production of the uh, ure urea transporter, which then helps to move selectively the urea in the inner medulla and reabsorb it. Okay. And I don't think I will complicate this by talking about ENAC. No, that's probably good. That's probably good. So that's it in a nutshell. OK. <clears throat> Questions? OK, let's flip the page and go to page three. Yes. So if you're turning on the ENAC channel, can you get a hypo uh, leave? So the, the question is, if you turn on the ENAC channel, can you get a hypokalemia, a hypokalemia, right? Hmm. Uh, you're not actually losing. You're, 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 actually, you're actually retaining water. And so the actual urine production is very low. And I, I, I would say that you're probably not generating or moving enough tubular fluid there to wash out potassium. So I, my, my answer, I think, is no. OK, so um, OK, um, stimuli, uh, regulation. <clears throat> there are two main things that regulate ADH, and a number of smaller ones. First, osmolarity. And second, volume depletion. And let's try and put these into some sort of perspective. There is a graph there. And it plots, um, it actually says AVP, that's arginine vasopressin, which is a synonym for. ADH, so I'll just put ADH there. And I think it expresses this as percentage change. Is that correct? Okay. So if we talk about osmolarity, and I'll do that in a different color, osmolarity. If we start at baseline, say here, baseline ADH, if you increase osmolarity, 1%, 2%, 3%, 1, 2, 3, you actually get quite a substantial increase in ADH. I said volume depletion. Sure enough, it does affect ADH, but you have to get, this is volume depletion. You have to get down to about 10 to 15 percent before it has any kind of substantial effect on ADH, but then it has a massive effect. And that should be pretty close to the shape of the graphs that you see. Um, so how do we reconcile this? And, and, and I'll, tr I'll try, to, try to put it into perspective. In my mind, ADH's main role 
is to control the osmolarity of plasma. And so it is super, super sensitive to changes in osmolarity. And these are detected uh, in the hypothalamus. Okay. So a very small change in osmolarity generates, generates um, ADH secretion and even small amounts of ADH are very potent at that V2 receptor. And, and I think you can see, if you look at, if you look at the graph, it's in picograms per mil, which is pretty, same, pretty much the same as picomolar. So even, so a one, one or two percent change in osmolarity generates um, an increase probably about doubles the ADH but even at that level the ADH is extremely potent at stimulating that V2 receptor and it will have an effect on retention of water okay so super sensitive and super responsive Okay. So, why does this plasma volume effect occur? And, I, 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 and, and by the way, I've got a note here, the US LME like to ask questions on this stuff. Okay. Um, so, at least in small amounts, plasma volume doesn't have much of an effect. But then when it gets down to 15% volume change reduction, it has a massive effect. Well, a, a loss of plasma volume of 10 to 15% is getting towards critical. Yeah. It, it, it's not good, okay? And so what that means is that we've got systems to try to hold on to plasma volume. We've got the sympathetic nervous system, we've got the renin angiotensin system, we've got the aldosterone system, and they've all screwed up because they haven't made it, right? So uh, what ADH says is, well, you guys screwed up. I know you really want sodium, but since you can't do sodium, I'm going to retain free water. At least I'll, I'll get some I'll get the plasma volume back up. It'll, you'll be hyponatremic, but at least you'll have a bit more plasma volume. And, and, and indeed, um, when you have a volume depletion and ADH kicks in, you will have a dehydration usually with a, a rather dilute plasma or, or hyponatremia. Okay. So that's the situation. Straightforward? Okay. So, other stimuli. Huh. Um, th there are actually a whole bunch of things, but I don't think I want to go through them all right now. Pregnancy, we just did that, right? On, on case, I think it was case 16. I don't know. The last case we did. So at least during, you know, between the, you know, around, around 10 weeks of pregnancy, you do tend to get uh, stimulation of ADH. Alcohol inhibits ADH. Any of you ever drink alcohol? No? <laughs> I've done a lot of reading. For those folks that do read, uh, drink alcohol, It's a diuretic, yes. Drink a six pack of beer, pee out an eight pack. Um, hangovers, dehydration, right? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Um, Cold will stimulate ADH. There may be a role of ADH in thermoregulation. Um, I don't think we need to go into that in any detail, but, but 
know that cold inhibits ADH. So when you get cold, do you want to pee more? That may be a sphincter effect, but it tends to be true. You guys never been out in the cold? Yeah. No, no? You're Tennesseans, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. Um, stress, so, and this is something that maybe a surgeon needs to know about. Uh, stress can cause ADH to be released, and, and, and then there are certain conditions that affect the brain, like meningitis. Um, and angiotensin II can also stimulate ADH. So, um, and there are a bunch of other things, and I just don't want to go into them right now. So, um, is that straightforward? Remember, though, that the most important things osmolarity and volume depletion. Okay, so what is, mm, what is ADH actually trying to do? It's trying to control osmolarity. In other words, its role is to retain free water when the osmolarity goes high. And very simply, as I said, if the osmolarity goes up, it's detected in the hypothalamus, ADH is secreted, and you retain free water to correct the osmolarity. Okay. Uh, a question arises, um, does it regulate blood pressure? Um, Remember that graph called it vasopressin? When we first discovered ADH, guess what it did? Vasopressin. Yeah, vasoconstrict. Look, I, I, give, him, give him some candy. I mean, I mean, it was such a super simple question. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's actually one of the most potent vasoconstrictors known. Uh, and, and so maybe it controls blood pressure and maybe it doesn't. And, and we, we, we don't need to get into that. I, I think it does, at least in certain circumstances. But from a clinical standpoint, it is often used for bleeding disorders. In other words, it's such a potent vasoconstrictor that it can it constrict constrict vessels down and, and stop bleeding. So it can be used for that. Ah, diuresis. What do I want to say about diuresis? Um, okay, um, when we've talked about diuretics in the past, there's really I'm, I'm going to call them three classes of diuretics. And I'll start with in sodium reabsorption inhibitors. Since sodium is the major cation in plasma, um, So diuretics can inhibit reabsorption in the proximal tubule, in the loop, thiazide in the distal tubule, and amylaride, spironolactone um, in, 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 in the distal nephron. So all of these diuretics work by inhibiting sodium reabsorption. There is also a flavor called osmotic diuretics. and probably diuretics. Probably the most common is glucose. So with a diabetic, you have an overflow of glucose in the proximal tubule. It can't get reabsorbed. Glucose is osmotically active, so as it as it, as it goes down the nephron into the bladder, it has to take water with it. And that's basically the concept of, a, 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 of an osmotic diuretic. Uh, if you give mannitol, which is a non-metabolized um, uh, uh, sugar alcohol, um, if you give it in big quantities, it will cause an osmotic diuresis also. 
So it's, it's, it's not a sodium reabsorption inhibitor, but it has exerts a, an osmotic effect if it's not reabsorbed. Um, you could argue that this is an osmotic diuretic too. Do you see what I'm driving at? If you inhibit sodium reabsorption, then the sodium stays in the tubule and it takes water with it, and so it, it causes essentially an osmotic diuresis. But there is also, what am I calling it now? Water diuresis? Yeah, water diuresis. The third is water diuresis, and we won't go into pressure diuresis. Di diuresis. So, in a water diuresis, it's unlike these, it's basically the ADH type effect. In other words, <clears throat> if you affect the distal nephron's ability to extract water, then you will tend to pee out more free water. And so the most obvious case is diabetes insipidus. In diabetes insipidus, for whatever reason, the distal nephron either doesn't see ADH or is not responsive to it, and we'll go through this a little more later. And so, because you can't reabsorb that water, you get a water diuresis. Um, there are a few other drugs that I've listed there, or a few other items. Um, uh, alcohol. Uh, water is, is a water diuretic agent. <laughs> okay, so you drink a gallon of water, you pee a gallon of water. Um, because it inhibits ADH. Um, and then there are a few drugs down there, and actually hypokalemia also can cause a white water diuresis through a mechanism that I'm not really familiar with. So those are the types of diuresis, and, and I only mention that because, you know, we're dealing with ADH now, and it's different, different from other types of diuresis. Okay, so let's finish off by looking at some clinical abnormalities. And I charge you with being able to draw darrow yannick diagrams for all of these. Do you remember darrow yannick diagrams? Are they exciting? Yes, good answer. Excellent. So, <laughs> and, and so you're saying, do I get a candy for that? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm feeling such, such a generous mood. <laughs> so, just remember, if you want candy, suck up to the prof, right? Okay. She, she's probably being sincere, though, I think. What's the first one there on the list? SIAD? Oh, diabetes and sepidus, right? Yeah. Okay. So what happens in diabetes insipidus? We can't preserve that water, and so we pee out a lot of free water. So what happens to the darrow yannick diagram? Does that make sense? Hypernatremia? and reduce volume because you're peeing out excessively. There are a couple of different types of um, diabetes insipidus. Uh, one is secretory, and the other is nephrogenic. Secretory is, is relatively rare. But nephrogenic can be of, from several causes. It could be the, um, 
the, the, the urea transporters that are faulty, it could be the receptor for ADH that's faulty, it could be aquaporin 2 that's faulty, okay? So all of these things can cause a nephrogenic uh, diabetes insipidus. So <clears throat> what do you do for, 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 for these people? What about this person? You guys want to be doctors? Let's give him vasopressin. <laughs> there is <coughs> There's actually a drug called desmopressin, which is an analog of ADH, and that can work to effectively make up for the lack of secretion in the hypothalamus. <coughs> what about these guys? What can you do for those guys? Well, hmm? well, I hear a lot of whispering. So, the first thing is that there are there are degrees of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And so when the form is fairly mild, you can probably just keep up with it by just drinking lots more water. OK? Um, there is, and, and you, you need to know about this because it, 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 clinically it'll be significant for you and I don't think it's, is it in the handout? No, I don't think it's in the handout. So you can, you can, you can restrict water. One of the best drug treatments for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is thiazides. I'm going to write that up. Thiazides. Uh, are you confused? I would hope so. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's really counterintuitive, but you use a diuretic to stop a diuresis. Um, it doesn't work with other di maybe a milleride a little bit, but it it's just one of these things that's kind of been hard to explain clinically. Um, th there are explanations that, 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 that you induce a volume depletion, it has effect on the proximal tubule, the load at the distal nephron is changed, but none of the explanations are really terribly satisfying. So empirically it works. So from a clinical standpoint, it's just one of those anomalies that you know is used you won't know necessarily why it works, but it does work, okay? A lot of people with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus can be well controlled by using sodium restriction and thiazide diuresis, okay? And you can actually reduce the volume of urine quite substantially by using a thiazide. Interesting. So any question on diabetes insipidus. Okay, the next one is syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. So inappropriate in this context is always too much. It's not inappropriately low, it's inappropriately high. So SIADH, and obviously I'm going to write it up as SIADH. And, and that was the case, the first case that we went through. Um, <clears throat> things that affect the central nervous system can sometimes cause the syndrome of SIADH. And I think in this particular case it was meningitis, uh, sometimes brain trauma. So what would this look like? ADH retains free water 
And so what you basically get is that kind of picture. You retain a lot of free water. It distributes evenly between the extracellular space and the intracellular space, and it looks like that. Okay. So, how could we treat that? Um, hmm, diuretic. Actually, we don't usually use a diuretic. I mean, re remember, uh, I think it was the f first case we did today. Um, water restriction is, a, is, is, is kind of an obvious thing. And, and remember, we had said that if, if, if there is some issue with brain function, then maybe a hypertonic solution to draw water out of the brain. Um, there is also now an ADH antagonist called Tolvaptan which can be used, okay? So it basically just, just competes with ADH at its receptor in the kidney, okay? Oh, and I do have an additional note. Um, <clears throat> heart failure. I think this is worth knowing about. So what happens in heart failure? The body detects a reduced volume, or at least a reduced effective circulating volume. And so it's cranking everything up to try to retain sodium. But it also stimulates ADH secretion. If it gets sufficiently bad and you get in sufficient distress, the apparent lack of volume stimulates ADH secretion. Remember the plasma volume when, when, when the body thinks that the plasma volume is going down 10 to 15 percent, it'll kick in ADH to retain free water. So in heart failure, we've already determined you can use furosemide or something like that. But also, there's some utility for using tolvaptin in heart failure. And it, it makes sense, doesn't it? It's, the ADH system is one of the systems that's contributing to volume overload. And so treatment with tolvaptin can be an effective treatment in heart failure. Okay. Good. <clears throat> What's next? Oh, psychogenic drinking. Okay. Huh. Oh, gosh. So, what would be the Darrow Yannett diagram for? What is psychogenic drinking? Okay, there are some people in this world, and I, I don't understand a lot about psychiatry. Did. did did anybody watch that Peter Sellers movie? Um, the black and white movie? Who's a movie buff? Um, How I Come to Lo Love the Bomb or whatever it was called. There was a general there that just kind of wanted to keep drinking fluid to, to purify his bodily fluids. And I guess it was a psychiatric dis... You, you never seen that movie? Oh, it's the best movie ever. <laughs> oh. Black and white. Um, but the, the <laughs> <laughs> but there are people f that, for whatever reason, um, have this compulsion to drink a lot of water, and I don't understand it. But hopefully, you guys will start to understand it sometime. Um, so uh, th th there is a syndrome of, of the, what does the Darryanit diagram look like if you just drink gallons and gallons of water to purify your bodily fluids? It looks the same as that. Uh-oh, can you distinguish? Come on, you're sharp people. Can you distinguish between psychogenic drinking and SIADH? Say what? You could test for ADH level. Um, 
Uh, yes. You, <laughs> you could. You could do a psych eval. I, I still, I'm still not thinking these are candy worthy. Eh. Say what? You're in volume, yeah. Uh, I mean, you guys are smart people, so one one of those guys is not peeing much, and the other guy's peeing like crazy, yes? And so, yeah, they look the same when you look at the Darianic diagram, but urine volume is drastically different. That is worth candy. <laughs> Have you had too much candy today? Don't, Don't think so? None? <laughs> oh, well, here they go. Yeah, so good, 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 good. What's next? Water depletion, well, it's just like diabetes, in, it's like we just, like diabetes insipidus, but, but you're not peeing, yes? So um, hopefully you could distinguish those things. Um, one last thing, and I, 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 I point this out because this was a board question. I think it's a hard board question. So in diabetes insipidus, you're peeing out a lot of water, right? And so your urine concentration should be about 100, yes? However, as that disease progresses, let's say in this particular case, it may go up to 700. You're saying, well, gosh, that's concentrated. But given this person's condition, he should be making urine at a concentration of about 1,200 milliosmoles per liter, right? He should be trying to extract. He, 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 he's, he's, he's lost so much free water that he should be extracting as much free water as possible making concentrated urine of 1200 milliosmoles per liter. So 700, although it looks like it's concentrated, it's remarkably too dilute for his particular situation. Okay? And so the reverse is also true for SIADH. For SIADH, you know, he's got a high urine osmolarity and I've listed 1400 to 300, so 300 is high urine osmolarity. It's high in his particular circumstances. Okay, he should be producing, um, he should be peeing out water at about uh, urine at about 100 milliosmoles per liter. And so, um, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't. You know, I don't like to test at that level. That's, that's one of those third order thinking things. But uh, you'll, I guess you'll see it soon enough when you get into the clinics. Uh, you'll, look at, you'll look at a urine concentration thing. Golly, shouldn't that be concentrated or shouldn't that be dilute? And so it's kind of a heads up. Um, but it, it's the sort of thing could come up on a step exam, OK? Because. The step people don't like medical students and they like to make your life difficult. Okay. All right. So much for my cynicism. Any questions? Okay. Let's finish. See you tomorrow for acid-base balance.